We know there's going to be a lot of wisdom in this room, but we also are so excited to build bridges between parents and educators who are bringing so much vulnerability to this conversation and so much real talk. So we invite you to interact with each other using the chat. You'll see that we do that also. And if you'd like to keep your video on, that would be awesome. But we know some folks are in transition at this hour. And other than that, if you just want to keep your microphone muted until the audience QA, there will definitely be opportunities to participate then as well as some polls along the way so that you can weigh in. Um, so just to talk about some of our outcomes for today, Real Talk is a conversation that bridges parents and educators. We are so excited to get to do that all the time through POSSUP and elevating the parent voice for schools. And this is a real life in-person event to do the same thing. So we want to hear your thoughts and ideas, and we hope that those prompt you to feel like a better educator and parent, and that it also prompts you to feel ready to take action, whether that is big or small. So I'd love to introduce you to our wonderful panel. We have Shawnee Dow, our CEO and founder of POSSIP. She is a former math teacher, a POSSIP parent herself, and will be facilitating our conversation today. We have Kevin Huffman, who is our policy panelist and former State of Tennessee Commissioner of Education. Tantra Love is our teacher panelist and Oakland USD 2019-2020 Teacher of the Year. And Kimberly Robinson is our parent panelist. She is the mom of a middle schooler and also a director of administration at Lyndon Waldroff School. But all of these people wear multiple hats and are educators and parents alike. So let's get to some real talk. If you like, you can also engage on Facebook. So we'll put that link in and you can have a conversation there as well. All right, so take it away, Shawnee. Yeah, thanks, Caitlin. So um, I would, part of these real talks with people and ideas I would love to just discuss anyway. So um, I'm super excited to be here today. So glad to have you all here and the folks who are gonna watch the recording. Um, so our real talk today is about relevant teaching in a contentious time. And this conversation came to mind for me as a mom of two kids, my husband's a school administrator, I'm a former teacher and I live in Tennessee. And recently Tennessee, like much, well, not much, some of the country, um, had legislation proposed, particularly around the backdrop around critical race theory. And as I was reading the legislation, I, was, I thought to myself, it would be illegal to even read this legislation to our students, which got me really thinking about what is the role of, of, of policymakers in curriculum? What is the role of teachers? What is the role of parents? And I also thought about the fact that what would be my comfort level with teachers teaching current events? Because my, my, what I said to myself is, well, it depends on if they agree with me or not. <laughs> so it got me to thinking all about curriculum and then it got us talking in our office all about curriculum. So as you can imagine, there's a lot here and we're excited to dig in. As Caitlin mentioned, some of it is we wanna just kind of like prompt and promote ideas and discussion, but we do also want you to walk away whether you're a parent or an educator or a policymaker with some ideas and thoughts and actions that you can start to take around the intersection between curriculum and families and, and, and educators. Before we dig in, we would love to start with asking the audience just a couple of questions. So we're gonna stop screen sharing and pull up two polls now. Uh, the polls are anonymous, so no one will see what you answer, but we want to just hear your thoughts. The first question is, who do you think has the most say in curriculum development? And the second question is, who do you think should have the most say in curriculum development? So just take a second um, to go ahead and share your thoughts and, and we'd love to hear. Yeah, and we'll see what folks said. I'm curious. You may have also done none of the above, which <laughs> is a perfect place. Um, yeah, so let's see what, so you should be, hopefully be able to see the poll. So what people think, who has the most say currently uh, is a, interestingly a pretty even split between curriculum specialists and legislators and who people think should have the most say uh, split all of the above or teachers or curriculum specialists. So it's interesting that there's pretty clear from here thought that parents shouldn't necessarily have the most say. So I'd be curious to think if people think parents should have any say. Um, I voted, so my vote is represented in there. So that's not to say that I think parents should have the most say, because that, that's bad so. Um, well, thank you all for sharing that. Um, so through POSIP, we get to see lots of family feedback about lots of things. And so through that feedback, we've seen um, some different opinions on curriculum. So I just want to go through two 
example um, quotes, and then we're going to look at a quick two-minute video, and then we're going to hear all from our panel. So here's one quote that a parent shared. I think the students should learn the good, bad, and the ugly parts of history and social studies without opinions or governmental filtering. Please, please teach the children to be critical thinkers, question everything, come to their own conclusions and opinions. That's what one parent shared. Another parent shared, it's important, but let's not lose perspective that teachers need to teach reading and writing and are not prepared to be talking about racism. Um, sometimes we see comments that are like so loaded that they might be hard for people to see, but we wanted to share these just as a reminder that part of why we want to have growth talk is so that people can have different perspectives, but hopefully we enrich ourselves collectively through uh, talking and conversing. So we're going to uh, watch a short video. It is about uh, um, something that happened in Tennessee. So Jasmine's going to share that, and then we'll turn this over and, and hear from our panelists. So Jasmine, you want to start the video? Thanks so much, Jasmine. Um, and it's interesting. We watched the clip as a, um, as a few team members, and we actually had some disagreements about what seemed to So just because we shared it doesn't mean that we agree with it, but we thought it was a good prompt and a good, good start. So I'd be curious to hear, and I'll start with you, actually, Kimberly, just watching that small clip and hearing what you hear. What, what are some of your initial reactions to what you saw? You're on mute. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's a real relevant topic. I, the part I picked up was teachers or educators are prepared to talk about race. And so I, it made me wonder if that's the case across the schools. So I think that I agreed and I disagreed with parts of the video. I think that racist people also work in education. And so whenever that conversation is in the mix, um, there's a toss up of personalities and opinions. That's, so yeah. in my opinion that there should be some standardization, but yeah, that video made me wonder about a lot. That's interesting. So, so part of what I hear you saying is that these topics should be covered. I, you, you question the, the assumption that teachers are all prepared to talk about it. And so for you, that might mean, lead to some need for some standardization. Contra, I know that not only were you recently in the classroom, but now you kind of oversee all TK teaching. Yeah, what are your thoughts as you look in the OUSD? What do you, what do you, what are your thoughts as you see that? that um, well, you know, teaching young children is such a, it's my passion, right? I love that age group. Um, and it's all, there's a big social emotional base and lens for what I'm doing um, mm -hmm. and really meeting kids where they are. And the, emotion that um, will get people to do the most is is fear right and so when I see that I just see a lot of fear and I think mm -hmm. you know when kids come to school for the first time they're afraid they're leaving their fam like you know that's a mixture I tell the kids on the first day like who was scared who was excited like I, you can feel all those feelings at once um, and you need to decide what's going to motivate you and have people around you that support you to get through that so I think um, really being able to talk about your fear, whether it's politics, whether it's saying goodbye to the family, whether it's a bug you see in the classroom, like having the tools to be able to talk about that is really mm. important. And we're all human and we all bring our experiences and we've all experienced things that are not good for us. And so I feel like our goal in the classroom and especially in the early years is really how to give kids the tools and the support and the love and families to be able to go and learn and not have that fear take over everything that you're doing. Because what fear does to your brain and what you let in and you can't is, um, is incredible. Yeah, we need to have all the adults go through your class and kind of get in touch with what's driving our decisions. And the other thing I hear is that there is also not only like what is taught, which is a lot of what we're talking about today, which is curriculum, but also who is the person who is teaching and what's happening for them emotionally as they teach it. So um, Devin, yeah, tell me your thoughts. I wonder if you ever have flashbacks when you see some of the stuff to your time <laughs> as commissioner. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's, it's sad. I felt sad watching it and um, I feel sort of cynical. Um, and my cynicism is really around like this construct of local control that mm -hmm. I feel like elected officials utilize to draw the line exactly where they want to draw the line. Mm -hmm. And so I feel cynical because I feel like if what was being taught was what an elected official wanted to see, then they would say, 
state overreach. You know, the state should not be dictating what's getting taught in the schools. Um, and I think one of the things from a policy perspective um, that's become clear to me over time is parents should call people out on um, some of the cynical use of uh, where people draw the line. You, you don't get to say districts should have say over X, Y, and Z in some circumstances and then go and make a state law forbidding districts from teaching certain concepts or certain things in different circumstances. And it's just utterly cynical. So how do, I mean, I think the challenge that I kind of think about is so many parents, parents who most depend on schools and school systems are often like the luxury of like calling your people, <laughs> you know, like knowing what's happening, understanding how it's all working. It just feels like really hard. I mean, I'm very, you know, knowledgeable of what's happening. It also feels like overwhelming to think about trying to like mobilize to just, you know, yeah, so how, but how do you think about that? And like the not, yeah, how, how does the average person or parent who's like, I, I want my kids to learn. I do think they should learn like everything. I want them to develop as a human and as a good person and, you know, the, the character skills that, you know, you talk about, talk about, like I want them to develop that, but I don't want all of this like political kind of stuff in the classroom, or maybe you do, I guess that's what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, but um, how do you think about that? So, well, one thing is on the whole, like, you know, how do parents get involved thing. Part of my experience has been watching um, a lot of people step into the void when parents don't get involved. And so mm. um, one of the things that I've seen with some of the discussions around critical race theory and also the discussions around masking and so on is that plenty of people who are not actually parents are showing up and sharing their opinions with elected officials and like carrying the day. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I think there's a necessity for parents to be more engaged. But I also think we, like the average person thinks that it takes more to sway elected officials and legislators than it does. And one of the, like one of my learnings when I came into state government was that legislators will get five phone calls from people and think that you know it's a flash flood like they really get moved by very little outreach and people have more power um, and the other thing is that people always call to complain about something they don't like and then legislators don't hear when there is something that they do like yeah well that's something I mean that's a, that's something value we have at PASA which is you know highlighting the positive positive as well I also hear you saying we don't have an option really because if we don't up from also in the void. Kimberly, what, yeah, what, what are your thoughts? I was going to add to your. Oh, you can mute yourself. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I was going to add to your question on parents. I think we really could do way more to um, deal with some of the barriers that keep parents silent a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. One thing that we know now is that parents need a space to process their own educational experience before they even feel safe to approach a school leader or even mm. a teacher or even another parent at the school. They have to examine and ask, what was my experience? Was Who was there for me? How did it look when people showed up for me or when they didn't? So I think providing a space for that can be really key. And so I think PASA does that for sure by just making it accessible through text message, helping schools learn how to create that feedback loop. But I think that will really help, you know, parents to kind of recognize their voice there. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, I also think, and I think this is also to the fact that someone else will fill in the void. I know there are a lot of parents who might say like, I don't care if my kid learns critical race theory or not, but that's all just like language that's used to distance. Like we use this formal language a lot of times it's used to distance. And so it makes it inaccessible for parents. They feel like they don't understand what you're talking about when they might be able to access it through a different lens, a different way. Um, yeah, Tantra, what are your thoughts on, should we expect parents to get engaged in these conversations about curriculum? Well, you know, I think something that pretty much most people have in common is that at some point in our lives, we have been a student. It doesn't matter if we stuck with school or not. So we all have a very strong opinion about that, <laughs> right? Um, and I think that that makes life amazing as a teacher and also hard because 
we are trying to filter what everyone's experience has been, right? Mm. And bring us to a common place. And I feel like school is a place where you build community and it starts in your classroom, right? Mm. And, and even when hard things come up, if you've built community and you have trust, really families will back you and engage mm. you and be part of conversations, even if it's a conversation they're not comfortable with. But when do classrooms get time to do curriculum and build community. You know, mm -hmm. if you spend time in the beginning of every year really building this foundation, it takes you lots of places. Like I know when my management is really amazing and engaging with the kids in the beginning, I have four-year-olds that never have been to school that read, right? And it's, they just exposed and they're safe and they'll take risks and they'll make mistakes and they'll try again. And so I think that schools are really hard to navigate. And this is my 28th year in education and I have seen cycles. And what school is like for me is not what school is like now that I teach, right? Mm -hmm. So I think with every family, you're bringing in those, you know, whatever their experience has been. And so I think it's really about building community and trust. And then you can have conversations about um, lots of different things. I mean, even like pets dying, right? You know, mm -hmm. that's that's a hard conversation to have with four-year-olds. But um, when somebody's pet dies, they come to school and say it, right? Well, it's all, I mean, you're talking, our last Real Talk session was about trust, but the idea that really part of the, part of this, and this gets back to what you're saying, Kevin, is some of the people who are fighting aren't in the school, so there's no relationship, so they're not, they don't really even have a stake, but uh, if you have trust in your community, in your classroom, you can cover difficult and contentious topics. So you can teach a curriculum if you have trust in the community still. And there's also a level of grace. Like there have been things where that I've seen in the curriculum where I've given feedback to the school about the curriculum, but I gave it in love because I trust them and I know that, you know, that they're doing their best. And so I think that trust component is such an interesting and important idea. And the intersection between curriculum community and like, you know, social emotional learning, that, that, that whole intersection. So I'm curious, uh, kind of a poll of each of y'all, to what extent do you want to see current events covered in school? I think I kind of, I think I probably echo Kimberly where I'm like, I, it depends on what the person thinks and it depends on how, comp how competent I am in their skills, <laughs> navigating and, and, and facilitating and building that community. But yeah, what are your thoughts? Well, I just, you know, I think for anyone that's a parent or an auntie or an uncle or grandparent, um, you know that if you ban something or you tell a kid that you're close with that you're not going to talk about something, that is the first thing they're going to bring up, right? And in the beginning of the year, I say to families, like, everything your kid tells me as I get to know them, I'm going to take that with a grain of salt and I'm going to let you know, right? I'm going to let you know because kids will come in and if you argued at home, everybody knows your business right so and I said and I trust the same thing like we all need context for the things that we're hearing and I just happen to be blessed with the name love right because kids love to say it and that is really what I feel like a classroom is about building inclusion right about accepting people who are different than you and knowing that we're all teachers and leaders and we can learn from each other and so um, I, I just think like, you know, I remember one year we do sound of the week and it was the letter C and the sound K -K -K. and this kid brought in this big book and they opened it in front of everyone and they showed this picture on cannibalism, right? Well, I can't, I didn't know that was coming, couldn't unsee it. I got this angry parents talking, like, how can you teach cannibalism? And the family said that the child had picked out a picture of cat, they had all rehearsed it, but when they came to school, that's not what that child, you know? Would I ever teach cannibalism? Like <laughs> in your right mind, do you think I'm gonna say, oh, five-year-olds, woo, we're gonna talk about cannibalism. But I had to address it and I had to meet them at their level of their curiosity about that which did not mean explaining everything about cannibalism. And it didn't mean ignoring it because if you know kids and you just say, you know, push it, they know when adults are lying. They know when adults are pushing things to the side. So mm -hmm. when you put parameters that things are off the table, you know, and there's just appropriate ways to talk about it. That's just an easy example that happens with everything, right? You know? Yeah, well, it's such a powerful example. I mean, I know, and as parents, you of course, connect with this because you can't help what your kids ask you about and all of a sudden you're like how did I end up down this <laughs> topic like I was not ready 
for this. Um, yeah, curious, Kimberly. And then Kevin, you have kids at kind of different age ranges. So you're seeing to what you said, Tantra, where you saw across different eight, kind of what education was like 10 years ago versus now. So yeah, curious, Kimberly, current events, what's your take? And then Kevin, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I think like Tantra was saying, you really can't avoid it. Every The children, the young ones will play and reenact what they see and what they hear. The older ones will have more language to describe what's going on in the world around them. So helping students to understand the world is a big part of education. And I think with current events, I always urge my teacher, err on the side of questions, help students to ask questions, to think, oh, how might this affect people? What might, you know, so just as age appropriate, kind of leave it to them. I also think it's really time for parents and households and grandparents to kind of take back our half of the education. I feel like my daughter can go out into the world and be confronted with any opinion because we have a strong habit of discussion at home and questioning at home and equipping her to kind of do that self analysis of the things that happen around her. So I think in schools, we also have a responsibility to give parents techniques on how to do that with their own children. Mm. And that will release some of the pressure because it's that, and that there's a great comment in the chat. It's, we kind of made school really hard for teachers because we're expecting perfection from them in terms of navigating like 30 different kids and things that come up and to say the right thing at the right time. And yet to your point, Kimberly, like our kids can have an experience that's imperfect at school, but we can help them at home <laughs> process and like make meaning of it. We don't need to put all of that pressure on a teacher to hit it perfectly or an administrator to hit it perfectly every day. Um, yeah, Kevin, what are your thoughts? Um. I mean, I think people need to build kids and adults, but let's focus on kids need to build the muscle of being able to talk about current events and life and politics and race. And if we're not helping kids build that muscle now, I mean, we all see what's happening across the country when people don't have that muscle well built, it's not good for the country. And so I think there's no choice and I think we need better training and better management to help people um, because it is tricky and complex. And I think parents need to have, um, you know, some generosity towards educators who are walking in tricky, tricky situations. But I just don't think it's, I don't think it's optional. Part of what I think rubs me the wrong way about the legislation around race and talking about race is I don't see how America as a country can thrive without building a citizenry of people who are capable of having these conversations. Yeah, a um, couple of thoughts, but yeah, I mean, it's, should we, I wonder, I think one of the challenges now is we don't have a shared set of history or principles or beliefs. Um, that's not even belief. We just need facts. Like we don't have a shared set of facts, I guess. And is that okay? Do we not need a shared set of facts? Our facts, you know, sometimes it seems like those in power get to kind of share it, shape the narrative. And is that just the reality? Or yeah, I don't know. How do we thoughts? I think it's all a story. It's all storytelling. It's mm. a story. There are many perspectives. So I don't even know if there can be a shared set of facts even, because um, most of what happens like is also subjective. But that's also important. Like if we were actually able to do that, even to say like, here is how this person experienced it. Here is how that person experienced it. So that we can say like, even given the same facts, like different interpretations, I think that would be really interesting. And I think coming to your point, one of the things we were talking about is we looked at the legislation, I don't know if you saw it, but it said basically you cannot teach anything that makes someone like unhappy. And, that, you know, I think we saw years ago when in universities, like there were, you know, people didn't like that there were things <laughs> where there are certain topics that weren't to be covered in universities, but they said, you know, college students wouldn't like it. So I think to your point, we all have to kind of like figure out ways to be able to discuss topics that are, that are tricky. So uh, Claude put something good in the chat, and I think this makes me think of a question I've had, which is how should this change based on the demographics of your class or district? So should what you teach and the, the content change based on the demographics of your students? So we 
you know, I'm from Texas, there is Texas history, that was unique to Texas, but we also think about in a district that is predominantly Latino, should you have Latino studies as a core place, and would that be different from a district that was predominantly Black? Well, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Um, Sometimes if you don't mind, I'll start with you. Um, I think we need to give multiple perspectives, um, whether they're in the room or not. You know, I've often been in the room um, and been the only Black person. And then there is an assumption that I speak for all Black people, right? And I'm sure that, you know, we there are differences of opinions. And there are people I love and don't agree with at all, but we can still have a conversation. Um, and so I think that that's really important. I, you know, my social studies curriculum is family and community and starting with the classroom community. So I do this program um, called A Life Like Mine where every child is highlighted. So people call it star of the week, but I take it a little bit deeper and it's really a, about um, customs and um, stories and songs and foods and um, places you go with your family that are important to you. So kids can see how they're connected, whether they look the same, similar or different. It's just that we get a flavor and families are invited to share in and you bring in pictures and we make things for you and honor you and kind of learn about who you are. Um, and I think that that's a really important piece is like who is in your community and then you can talk about it. And then it's, um, I, I, we do this, Thing. A lot of early childhood people do it called I feel statements, right? So when there's a conflict, like a kid bites somebody else, right? And the adult in me is like, oh, that you need to bite them back and then they'll learn, right? And you will ask kids, right? And they'll say, I feel sad because they bit me. And then you ask them what they want to do. And 90% of the time, the other kid will say, I just want them to be my friend. They are not vindictive. They're not anything. So that piece about perspective is just like, can you see that that hurts me? Like I, I have two young black men. Those are my boys. I have to teach them to walk in a way to be safe every day that maybe if you're not black, you don't understand. Like every day, there's a way they have to carry themselves to make sure that they are safe in this world something I take very seriously. Now, if everybody was saying to their kids, you know, in the world, there are kids that this is how they have to approach the world. This is how they might be different. Then maybe it would be easier for my kids to do that, right? They don't get the benefit of the doubt. I don't get the benefit of the doubt. You know, I have to come with, I, I am filled with love, but I have to come with so much more so that people will listen to what I have to say, mm, you know? Awesome. And, I, and I'm privileged as a woman compared to my boys who are men. So I think that perspective, I think hearing that, someone might say, well, you know, you overreact, but they'll hear that, they'll hear it, right? And it's just like, can you hear and acknowledge? If we could start hearing and acknowledging whether we agree or disagree, that's the first step in making these kind of changes. And I'm curious, this is such a small detail, but you, you, the curriculum you teach, did you choose that for your class or how was that? How did you come to I that? created it with my friend Leah. Um, we were teaching and we were just like, you know, I love that kids are highlighted, but I really want to do more, right? And mm -hmm. so she, she um, taught second grade. So she scaffolded it, made it a little bit harder where the kids like wrote a story about some topic, right? And so then they all got to hear it and it wasn't, it could have been like favorite superhero, but you got to hear different perspectives and who people lift it up, right? It's just that's the culture of your home and where you come from, right? That's so, so powerful. And part of why I'm almost like doing a duh, like who who drafts curriculum? Like that's the companies. Like I'm thinking like your curriculum should be out there and like you know should be adopted. But like why not? It's uh, or, or, uh yeah, it's um it's an important reminder that there's so many teachers who are creating really great things in their classrooms that don't necessarily get out because they're driven by the motive of their students. And so, uh, yeah, that, that, that doesn't always like, the profit motive is a powerful right. driver, unfortunately. Yeah, but and a lot of teachers yeah. are about sharing, right? And like best practices and how do we lift each other up, right? And that is not who makes um, assessments and tests and um, that there's no profit in that. So, yeah. um, you know, if I decided I really wanted to make some money with this, it might change how it does. And that's not my view of what education should be.
Yeah. Right. It's Kimberly, not about yeah. profit. Yeah. Kimberly, what are your thoughts? I and I'm also, if you could bring it, if you could weigh it also, if you have a very unique perspective, I think, because if anyone knows Lyndon Waldorf School, they have a very unique kind of model for teaching, which is, I'm not, you can probably cheer about how the curriculum, but it feels like it's very like kind of driven by the students, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, very driven by the teacher, very driven by the student is definitely um, meant to be evolving. It's meant to be reflective of the experiences of the people in the classroom in a lot of ways. Um, and I really think the purpose there is to be relevant. Like we know that students learn best when they're connected, when they see themselves. Um, but I really appreciated what Tantra was saying about helping students to see other people as well. Kevin, what are your thoughts? Should we all be learning the same thing? Should it be, should it vary based on your city, your state, your demography? I think there's a broad set of things that we should all be learning and teachers should have latitude in how they deliver. But I think there's a broad set of things that we should all be learning. I just think about, you know, growing up as a white kid in a mostly white school the number of things about the country, about our history um, that I learned from my parents and my family that were not taught at school that sh could have and should have been taught at school. And that honestly, I think um, not learning those things is a detriment to being successful in a multiracial society. So I think there's a common set of things that are important for virtually every kid. And it's probably a mistake to say, well, you know, white kids don't need to learn this. Or uh, I just, I think teachers can have latitude on how they deliver things, but I'm a pretty big believer in a, a common set of things that are universal. Uh, speaking of, um that I, I mentioned earlier, I think the last time I saw such controversy was when Common Core was being implemented. And I know you were a uh, commissioner at that time. What do you think are the similarities? Like what's happening? Like why are these two times when people are so riled up about curriculum? Yeah. And even Common Core, at least was a real thing that was <laughs> truly happening. Uh, this is, you know, like not necessarily consistently happening in the places where it's being discussed. So yeah, I'm curious. It was a real thing though. The things that people were complaining about were not real. And so one of the things that's similar is um, it's a lot of misinformation, a lot of intentional misinformation, a lot of things that people were getting off of Facebook or websites. And I bet if you did a Venn diagram of the folks who were showing up at school board meetings to complain about you know, CRT, and the folks who were showing, showing up to complain about Common Core, there'd be a whole lot of overlap between those two groups. And I think a lot of it is just misunderstanding what actually is being taught and fear that is driven by social media and the internet and so on. Um, and a lack of listening to teachers. Um, one of the unique things about Common Core is that legislators would hear from angry riled up people. And then they would be shocked when they would get out of their office and go visit schools and have teachers say to them, actually, I like Common Core. And here's why I like Common Core. And here's you know what I'm doing. And um, uh, there was just a broad disconnect and teacher voice didn't get heard by legislators in the same way that um, some of the opponents' voices were heard. I think that's the theme. I think connected back to what Tantra was sharing, which is that teachers are so busy teaching and they have all these other places where their voices matter so much. And teachers and parents are, you know, th those jobs are big enough. Um, I'm curious, Tantra, you started talking a little bit about the curriculum you created. What should a teacher or what, what should folks be thinking about as a design curriculum? You've talked a lot, you talked a little bit about the social emotional. As you think about like higher grades, how do we bring some of that stuff that you're thinking about in? TK into some of the upper grades as well. Like, what are some of those frameworks you, you think about in, when, when you're designing curriculum? Well, I wish that in the country we embraced education more and we put more resources into education because I think, um, um, and everything, you know, I think there's, there's a people that get to work and apprentice under people 
and really study a craft are really good at it. They're going into it because they're curious about it and they see someone who's passionate about it. So I think in your classroom, you need to be passionate and you need to make it feel like kids are coming into you, right? And them, right? And that you're building that. And that these are things that we're going to teach, but I might have this way to read a story and someone else might have this way to read a story. I might sing the alphabet song this way, someone else might, but we're making sure that all those things are covered. Um, I think people need to feel heard, families, kids. And I know that a lot of parent conferences don't, most of the time is not parents wanting to know about their kid. It's wanting them to feel heard and listen to. I don't think we do that enough in our country. I, there's like these things that I think need to happen um, mm. just around that, around like we can all set up our classrooms in like, how do you start the first week, no matter what grade? You know, if you look at brain studies scans of like teenagers and four and five-year-olds, they're the same because you're going through puberty, right? And so, but they want to be treated differently. So I think there's stuff to learn like that older teachers need to learn about early childhood and early childhood teachers need to learn about older kids. And we really need to share that and um, have a lot more professional development and time to dive into curriculum. Um, there are districts that pick a curriculum and they stick with it for seven years and really know it and then reevaluate, is this like the way we wanna teach? And there are districts that pick new curriculum year after year. So as a teacher, as you're just learning mm -hmm. something, it's changing, right? So I think there needs to be um, the resources put back on the importance of education. Like Kimberly said, families are the first teachers. We need to honor that and bring that in as much too. Um, and I just, I feel like if we could do those things, um, then it would be a better system. Yeah, and that, yeah, Kimberly, I'll love for you to talk a little bit more about what it looks like to help families. And then we're going to do actually, before you answer this, we'll do a quick poll. So I'm curious, what do you think it looks like to help families understand what their child is learning and, and, and to learn a curriculum? So we're going to put a poll up really quickly just to try to get a quick pulse on to what extent as a parent, and if you're an educator, you can use your parent head. As, as a parent, to what extent do you think about what your child is learning at school? So love to see what folks think about this. And I'm curious, Kimberly, for you to just share how parents should be involved in thinking about what their kids are learning. And then I think we'll probably turn it over to the uh, panelists first, I mean, to the audience for some questions. I think that, I think it varies. It depends on the family. There are a lot of factors, just time, experience, personal experiences in school. There are so many factors to go into how much parents want to know, what they can absorb, how many people are in their family. It's just such a wide gamut. And so I think as schools, we try to give them quick ways to access mm -hmm. like scope and sequence or sharing unit plans or sharing lesson plans. Um, and also just like conferences, I think it's up to teachers really, like Tantra was saying, to really get to know the families and know what their goals are for their students and where to be able to meet them too. Teachers are not only teaching students, but definitely engaging the whole family and kind of being on this educational journey. And I, think and I love that too, like having it as a, I mean, that's, I know it's a lot of work, but to have it at a point that's accessible for parents. Um, and it does, like, I find as a parent, the more I know, for better or for worse, the more I might have some thoughts or ideas, but at least I, I can share either feedback with the school or I can help contextualize for my child in ways that are meaningful to me. And that helps, I think, some of the earlier conversation, it helps decrease the load or impact on schools uh, to kind of navigate all the conversations. If the school can provide the basis of a conversation and then at home, I can infuse my values onto it or what we believe or how we make meaning of that. Um, but that requires us knowing what you're talking about or what's happening at school, which I don't think is always the case. Um, well, this is interesting and encouraging as a parent or guardian. How do you think about that? Do you think about what your child is learning? And folks said frequently or occasionally. We are educators, so we were probably, um, you know, slightly kind of biased. But I'm curious what types of things people, and if, if anyone wants to either put in the chat or share, or if any of our panelists have an answer, what types of questions do you have about what your child is learning? What are some of the things that you think about or wonder about?
I know for me, I have a child in middle school. And so I always want to know what she's reading. They read a lot of chapters on chapters. Sometimes she reads them before bed. And it's just like our personal value system that what you read um, gets ingrained in a different way mm -hmm. than kind of what's spoken to you or just talked to you or talked to you orally. So I always want to know about the book. And one idea that the parent had, of course, every parent wouldn't have access to this and the teacher really supported us in was every time they have a reader, like they have a schedule of readers throughout the year, a parent would kind of commit to reading it and bringing us kind of the adult gist, either by email or in a conversation, oh, that's a um, just for us, A, to help them, help them come along. And the teacher, our teacher does a really good job of sharing kind of what are the what are we trying to gain from these stories, either in a literary context or from the concepts? So I think there are some ways that parents can get involved with the literature in, in schools and lessons. Kevin, mm -hmm. what about you? And you kind of you have two kids and kind of uh, elementary. How do you lean in? Yeah, I mean. I always want to know sort of what's the content and are my kids at the level that the teacher would want them to be at? Because you see your kids writing and you know what it looks like, but you've got no comparison to other kids or what the teacher's sort of expectations are. Um, and so just having a sense of, okay, are we, are there things we need to work on? Are we moving in the right direction? Um, you know, I, um, I had a conversation with a friend last week and it was sort of interesting because he was talking about, he was nervous about what was going on with his kid who is a kindergartner. And um, he seemed resigned to this idea that he wouldn't know the answer to his question until November when the next parent teacher conference was. And you just think about how silly that is, how crazy that is when lines of communication haven't been opened up. And you got a parent just sitting around wondering something that's important to them about their kid and what's going on in school. And they're thinking, I'll know the answer in five weeks. I'm guilty of that. I do the same thing. Actually, you're convicting me. Like I have these questions. Why don't I ask them? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, Tom, you're on the other end with your, 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 your son. How, how did you engage with their curriculum? And then we're going to turn it over. I'm going to have Jasmine kick us off for some audience questions but yeah curious how you thought about it with your with your children um well you know I was always very curious um and when they would talk about things it would be a wondering you know like mm. well, what did they think about that right and if I, as a family we had a different perspective um we would talk about that I think it was good to engage because in life they're going to continue to come up to people that don't agree and you know with them or see the world differently and so how do you navigate real life um, by that. And so I think my boys felt like they could also bring that perspective back to the classroom, right? So mm -hmm. that if there was a topic that they didn't agree with, or they felt like there was a perspective that was missing, they felt like they could share it. Um, I remember that my dad, you know, I was embarrassed. My dad would come in at a certain time every year and talk to the whole school about something that he felt that the school didn't talk about enough, right? And it was like, oh yeah, and he brought in the slide projector. And, you know, now I'm like, oh, how lucky I was to have that, you know? But I, I think that, that that is a piece. And I think that as a teacher, there's a responsibility to make sure that those lines of communication are open, whether that's a newsletter. Now it's even easier. Like, you know, a lot of people can look on texts and emails. And um, I feel like because of COVID, it's hard because just being on the playground before and after school was a time that I think some parents who were picking up yeah. could approach. Um, events in the evening, like back to school nights and celebrations were other times where people could see you. And we're just not physically accessible right now. And hopefully that will come back. But I, I think there is a responsibility. Like when that whole thing happened around cannibalism, I sent an email right away to the family saying like, I want you to know this came up. This is how it was handled, you know? And the, the parents that were upset could didn't even read the email. Like they just couldn't get past mm. that, you know? Um, and the family that was actually most upset was the person whose kid did it 
right? They didn't realize it was their child who had brought it up. So, oh, no, you know, I just think like you have to bring them back in the loop. You know, like I have parent kids who come and say, oh, I'm going to have a new baby brother or sister. And then I will secretly say to the family, don't know if this is true. You don't have to tell me, just want you to know your child is really excited and put it in putting it out there so people are going to come up to you mm. so that there's that heads up right so it's just like you know like if I have toilet paper on my shoe I want someone to tell me before mm -hmm. I walk around everywhere right um so there's those pieces about it but I think it's that curiosity Kimberly said like at home we're teaching our children too and so that piece if I say that um you know this is uh brown and my kids know it is brown and they go to school and the teacher's like, no, that's pink. Well, if I, if that has been an important value to me, then they're going to be able to debate about whether this is brown or not and bring their own pieces and not lose who they are because of it. So I think, and I think we all need to be telling our kids stories about who we are and what's important to us around lots of things, race, values, you know, everything. And you're just highlighting the power of the bridge because I don't think we, and I know, I mean, as a teacher, like you don't, I didn't necessarily think enough about what is the bridge that can then, you know, we know what can go from the classroom to the home, but what can come back from the home into the classroom. And I don't think we think about that enough. Contra, uh, Laura wanted to know what was the topic that your dad, if you don't mind sharing. Um, it was Black History and he would come in, you know, he, he grew up um, in Atlanta um, and he was born in 1934. So he talked about being in the marches and then he spent time living in Africa for a while and would talk about that and just felt like that was important for people to see um, and for them to see him with me um, and that that was a legacy. And I have adults who walk into me and say still to this day, like, oh, I remember what, they don't remember what he talked about, but they remember he was there, he was present. He was a teacher for them. He was an adult you looked up to. The other piece is like, I go to playgrounds and like my kids are too old to play on the playgrounds, right? I still have that parent and teacher piece in me. If I see a kid not being safe, I step up and say something. Adults are afraid to talk to children. I mean, there's a lot of issues going on that I think I grew up in a, in a neighborhood where I was responsible to every adult on my street. Whether my parents agreed with what their rules were or not, if I did something that an adult didn't think was appropriate, they were going to say something and I knew it was going to get back. And I think we've lost that. Um, and I think that that's important. And that's like sharing different perspectives on everything, right? Yeah. Kimberly, I think Kimberly recruited me to do some Kwanzaa sessions at my kids and they kept varying <laughs> levels of excitement for But now, now they, they're kind of a little bit proud. Um, Jasmine, you want to start us off with your question? Um, and then hopefully we'll have time for a few more questions. Yes, thank you all panel. You all were awesome. I'm not a parent personally, but I do have a younger sister who is in high school right now. And we saw that clip earlier of the school district and families being upset. Um, when it comes to you know representation in a classroom, sometimes the loudest parents are the parents who would be least impacted or who have children who would be least impacted if you know racism wasn't talked about. So like, what do you do in those situations when like the parents who are maybe gonna be least impacted are the loudest, but then the parents of the black and brown kids maybe somehow aren't as vocal or they are vocal, but their voices aren't being heard. Like, how do you respond as educators to that? How do you value black and brown voices in that context? That's such a good question. I think for me right now, it's becoming increasingly A-OK -okay for me to point out when people's privilege is making them safe and just ask them to consider if what the experience of a person with less privilege would be. I like that language you said, their privilege is making them safe. I was gonna say, Kevin, you talked a little bit about this earlier. I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that. And, and the other folks in the chat have questions, feel free to put them in. Yeah, I mean, it's just such a great, it's such a great question. And at the sort of policymaker level, it's really important that we have organized ways for parents to communicate, that we have groups that are actively ensuring that parent voice of all parents 
are getting surfaced because otherwise people, it, it really is true that the people who are the least impacted are the ones who make the most noise. And if you, I mean, giving benefit of the doubt to legislators and school board members or so on, they can't parse out what the public sentiment is. Um, they only hear what they hear. And, but parents, the most marginalized voices are not going to be able to, to call a legislator. And so we have to have groups that help organize people. Yeah, and it also makes me think, um, just at a school level too, the power of like having strong relationships with your families within the school so that you can mobilize um, your, your families when you want to, or that they trust you, they trust your perspective, you've got a different perspective than whatever like the narrative might be. Um, but thanks Jasmine for that question. Um, other questions, thoughts? I know um, we're coming close on time. Or comments. All right. Well, I know we've got four minutes left. And I think Caitlin, you've got some some closing up and some next steps for us. Yes. And I had a million questions, but I won't ask. ask one, Caitlin. <laughs> well, I was just really intrigued by when Tantra was talking about like the way that teachers react to and respond to and live in curriculum. And I guess I was just wondering, do you feel like teachers get enough support and development around how to interact with curriculum rather than like how to, you know, maybe teach the curriculum, but just how to have a relationship with curriculum, if that makes sense, because you have a philosophy around it, a deep philosophy around it. Yeah, I don't think we uh, get enough time to talk about it. I, I, I can think of years that were really powerful when I was in a district where once a month, a whole grade level would get together. So every teacher that taught that grade in the entire district, and we would be talking about, you know, it didn't matter if it was math or English or social science that we could all say, oh, and then we could talk about, oh, well, this is how I'm gonna try to teach it. And this is what I think, and this ties to that. Because for me as a veteran teacher, I can look at my grade level and I can go, I know where they need to be by the end of the year. And newer teachers are trying to figure it out. They're living in the moment, right? And so I just think that that, that collective voice is really important being able to take a deep dive, which is what we want our students to do. You know, we want to introduce something and let them sit with it and try it in different ways because then we know they're really engaged and understanding what we're trying to teach. And that is what we should do, you know, as well. And I just, early on the earlier comment, I just wanted to say like, if we don't learn from our mistakes, we're not doing any better. So when we, when there, have, there are mistakes that have been made for many different groups of people in this world. And if we don't acknowledge that and make a change and pivot and do something different, then we're just gonna have the same thing continue to happen. And the longer you're in any system, you start to see the cycles you know, of things that have gone around and around. And it's just a new face on something that we've had in the past. So I just feel like those are really important things to remember. That's super powerful and, and just uh, like I think what you said really summed up the relevant teaching in contentious times, which is the curriculum matters and the ability for teachers to get to connect themselves and their students to the curriculum is what matters even more. Um, and so thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Caitlin, you want to take yes. a I will close us up. So just want to say thank you uh, for all the passion and wisdom you brought to this conversation. You are all so powerful and we really appreciate this real talk. So um, thank you so much for everything you brought to the table again. And um, I'm just gonna close with that. I'm just gonna sit with that good, good feeling from this real talk and we welcome you back to the next one. Um, so thank you so much and have a lovely evening. <laughs>